Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I'm honored to have my first actor on the show. He's all the way in Auckland and I'm all the way here, but he, you might know him from Sione's Wedding, the Pineapple Lumps ad. He's also been an avatar. I'd like to welcome David Van Horn. How are you doing, sir? Kia ora. Oh, I'm, go- I'm doing well, man. Nice yep. to be here, man. Yeah, nice man. to see you growing up a little bit. I've known you for many, many years and haven't seen you in, what, 10? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably remember me from when I was, what, six, seven, when I was just a little kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We could go on about a lot of a lot of different stories. I'm sure, probably not appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> so, I, how's... I, yeah, I've got uh, I've got some funny stories, but I, I won't. I won't yeah, yeah. Say them now. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, off air. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, how's everything been going with in terms of the the acting circle and the creative arts? Uh, considering COVID nineteen has uh, pretty much put a massive dent in it. Yeah, look, it's um, it's been, uh, how, jeepers, man, it's it's been scary for a lot of people. You know, like their livelihood is at risk. But you know, we're extremely blessed uh, down in New Zealand that you know productions are starting to come back here. Like film and television is back up and running. Uh, Theatre's taken a massive, um, massive hit, uh, just for the fact that you know people couldn't go and sit in the theatre, and um, and that's really scary because you know a lot of people that's their livelihood is, is creating shows, you know, at the comedy festival, you know, shut down. That's, you know, that's really hard, man. Like people work for, for months and months to get their material ready and they like relying on that show. And it's suddenly, it's just like the whole thing's can. It's, it's, uh, it's tricky. I, I, I really am worried about, you know, the state of uh, theater and not just in New Zealand, but around the world, you know, theaters are always uh, struggling to get by and rely on a lot of funding and, getting bums on seats and when you can't get bums on seats it's like you know what do you do so it's it's been scary in that um in that regard to you know something that you love so much and that is so valuable to society is just like put on hold for a long time you know and that um yeah, that, sure. that is really really um scary but like i think at first when when covid uh was you know uh, we we're going into lockdown and it all happened so quickly you know we didn't have anything to go by, you know, so no one knew what was going to happen next. Yeah, that's and right. yeah, and productions all shut down, like, um, well, they were like just going like that, you know, shutting down, you know, big productions that were here for ages. It's gone, shut, 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 shut. And it was really concerning because, you know, a, a, these productions need insurance to start back up, you know, and that, that was the thing that made me like really worried is like, if, if insurance companies aren't going to back these productions, we could be really, our industry could be in danger down here. But because our government led the charge so well and we managed to contain it, now we're this haven, you know, <laughs> like where yeah, that's people right. are fighting for studio space, you know, so like there's, there's a lot of productions um, starting to, you know, appear on the radar down here and um, the ones that were here before are starting back. And so that's really good for the film and television sector. And, you know, it could be a really great thing for New Zealand actors because, you know, a lot of the time we're more left to pick up the scraps of um, tiny roles and, and things, you know, which are great. You know, you get a payday and you get to work on a big international produ- um, production, but, you know, they could be flying in people from Australia or the States for roles that you could cast here. So um, it might be a chance for Kiwi actors to really shine and have an opportunity to to take a role that could maybe in the past have gone to an international actor. So, you know, it could be be an amazing thing for the acting industry in New Zealand. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been reading, you know, I I think I read today on the Herald that 250,000 Americans are trying to, trying to get a visa here. Um, And yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's painted New Zealand in a very, very good light. So I'd imagine more foreign investment will happen as well. So definitely. Yeah definitely think so yeah sorry no it's just yeah, yeah I think, say that, say that. Mm. yeah i just um i mean it, it's really good for our um our crews i mean new zealand is a has long been uh, a sought after destination to film in because of you know our for one the seasons are different so if you're trying to shoot a commercial for you know the summer in the states you can come down and shoot it here and it's ready to go like so you've kind of we've got that we've got an amazing landscape 
but we've got awesome crew. You know, our crew work tirelessly. They're amazing and they're good at their jobs. And uh, that is really, I think, what makes New Zealand films so strong is that we've got a, there's not as much of a hierarchy here um, in the film industry as you yeah. might find overseas. Uh, it's more of a, everyone chips in and respects everyone's job and we, we get it done together. And I think that attitude really makes for a, a more cohesive uh, set environment. You know? So I think we're, uh, we've always been a destination that uh, people want to shoot in for all of those factors. But now the fact that we, you know, you can come down and isolate for two weeks and then you're, you're good to go is pretty amazing. Yeah, totally. Have you done any work within the QMU film studios? Uh, yes. That's a, yeah, because yeah, that's uh, the first one, eh? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's huge, man. It's awesome and it's growing, um, which is exciting. You know, I think we could, um, we could benefit from, you know, international money and productions coming down here and building bigger sound stages and, you know, and then, you know, once we get through or if we get through this whole COVID nightmare, um, you know, we're left with amazing studios and our industry maintains, you know, the busy period that <laughs> just carries on because there's like the one thing is is that we've proven is that people want content right like netflix is going like crazy amazon apple disney i mean sony all of them you know all the big studios are just crushing it um like well, marvel's under disney now isn't it so yeah, all of yeah. those productions man like they just and that you know it takes a long time to shoot one of those big blockbusters so you come down here and they set up shop for you know, 18 months, that's employing a lot of Kiwis and putting a lot of money into our you know, that's a that, That's a good segue into Avatar because that's what the the big block, blockbuster that you worked on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Probably um, the biggest thing? The biggest thing? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, it was the highest grossing film. You know, that's not um, often that you get to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm like, let's just like, I was tiny in it, but it was an awesome experience. But I, hey, tiny. I remember you, man. I remember the part exactly where you were. I was like, yes, I know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> you were the gunner in that ship. Yep. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yep. I was and the you bad got, guy that you got one line, blew up the tree. Yeah. One oh, line. Yeah. I th yeah. One line or something like that. <laughs> there was a few like throwing in, but yeah. Yeah, 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 basically, it's just like I just want to appear in it, man. <laughs> like, you know, growing up as a like, I love Star Wars. You know, that was the thing for me was like Star Wars was epic, and I remember, you know, just being like, oh man, if I could just be one of those X-wing pilots or something like that, you know, I'd love that. Imagine that, you know, you the rest of the time, you know, there's you, and I got to do that, and and Avatar, and I got to live that that childhood fantasy of playing a, you know, a spaceman in a movie. <laughs> it was pretty cool. How did yeah. that? How did that so even come about? Like, um, so, going back a while now, uh, look, they were doing auditions in Auckland, and I think the auditions were fairly generic at the time. Like they were basically there was a, a few scripts that were sent out because everything's always highly confidential, so they yeah, don't always send out scripts that um, could in, find their way onto the internet and be published everywhere. So, did they had? Um, a script for like uh, scientist characters and a script for soldier characters and maybe I can't remember what the other one was but I auditioned for like a soldier character and bro I, I went hard out <laughs> for my audition because I was like I was like I love James Cameron's movies when I was like growing up and you go oh look the chance of me getting in this is just so slim but I'm gonna have fun while I do it you know so I think I had like my xbox headset you know with the like the walkie talkie but here and mm. i went to the two dollar shop and bought this gun and like dressed up and you know i did the scene and i think that was in like march yeah it was like early in the year did the audition and then didn't hear anything from it and then for like months and then i got a recall they like my agent called me up and was like yeah you got a recall um they they liked your first tape they want to see you again so um, this time I went even more hardcore. I was actually with my friend at the um, at the time who was uh, in the army, and he was like, "Oh, bro, like I'll lend you my webbing. You know, like you can like wear some of my gear." And I was like, "Oh yeah, cool." So I like dressed up, and like, and then the weird thing was, is I actually like parked right out um, by the casting place uh, across the road is like the New Zealand army base. 
stands. <laughs> I like parked my car and I was like, and all the army gear. I was like, oh man, I better like move quickly. Otherwise they might be like, get into some drill over here. But um, yeah, went in and did the audition. And then you kind of just like, you have to learn to forget an audition. Like you, you do it and you've got to let it go. Otherwise it just plagues you. You just sit around and you're like, wonder if I got it. I wonder if I got it. And I had let it go really. And, um, and then now it's coming up to say that year it was coming up to Christmas and everything was shutting down, all the productions were shutting down, and I think Avatar at the time was due to wrap right before Christmas, so my agent called me up and was just like, look, let it go, you did the recall, but they would let you know by now, the whole production shutting down, I was like, oh, I'd forgotten about it anyway, it's all good, and then like February the next year, I think it was, um, I was down in Raglan with my friend, and I just got this call, and it was like, you're jumping on a plane to not, uh, tomorrow morning and you're flying to Wellington to meet James Cameron. And I was just like, what? You know, like I'd com- like a year ago, it was like, and I just completely forgotten about it. And um, yeah, jumped on a plane the next morning and um, flew down with another, the other guy that was actually the pilot in the, um, oh, in yes. the ship. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a good friend of mine, Kelson Henderson. He's an awesome actor. And we actually had worked together on Sione's wedding as well before that, but didn't know each other super well. So he played the security guard in the big fight scene that we did in the car park. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd met Kelson a couple of times and it was strange because we actually met in the, the, the departures uh, to go to Wellington. But at the time, we were both competing for the role. So they were, they'd flown us both down. It was like, who's going to get this role? And so it was quite weird because it's like you're hanging out with this guy, but it's like one of us might get this role and the other one might be on the plane home tomorrow or tonight um but we ended up sitting around down in wellington together for like uh, over a week you know waiting to meet james um cameron to you know to decide if he wanted to cast us or not um but that that was actually a really cool period because we got to sit on set we got like full costume we got to like go check out the set and have a look around and read the script or uh so and we got it and we formed a really cool friendship through that time. And then they were just kind of like, look, there's multiple roles. You probably both get a part. And we did, you know, Kelson's the pilot. I was the gunner. And then they called in our other friend, Jacob, to play as a navigator. So it was cool. We like, I was walking with like two really good friends of mine, you know, on a movie that was like, all your dreams come true, really. <laughs> was James Cameron everything you thought he would be? You know how you, I've heard the tales of him being like a real staunch director and he nails cell phones to walls and just gets really aggro. But what was your experience with him? Yeah, look, man, I heard those stories as well. And that <laughs> it fills you with terror because you <laughs> want to do, you want to do well, right? You want to, yeah. and um, yeah, this is the chance and you want to, you want to have the best time and have the best memories possible, but you'd hear these rumors of, of things like that. But dude, I can honestly say he was super nice to me, man. He was so nice. He was a really cool dude. Um, I did witness, you know, um, I did witness him sort of losing it at a crew member. And I don't know if he was just, uh, he wasn't justified in it, but dude, I don't know. Um, can you imagine what the pressure would be like to have that much money in us? Like, riding on the oh, film yeah. that you're in control of like for sure yeah so i'm not ex- not excusing you know behavior of yelling at people in that but like high pressure but look he was really nice to me um like talk to me like a like a like a human being because sometimes you know in our industry you can be just like moved around like a warm prop you know like but he was really cool and um apologized for us waiting around and all that you know and it was just like wow man i did not expect that i didn't I thought he would be just a taskmaster, but he treated us really well. And then we actually went back up. Kelson and I went up to LA like a year later to do some reshoots. And um, because they changed the whole, I mean, it was ever changing that script. Um, And at the time when we were shooting, actually, I think the writer's strike was on. So he wasn't actually legally allowed to make any changes to the script. Uh, Ah. Which, you know, know, at that time, because it had been locked off and it was, there was all this weird, stuff going down i'm not too clued up exactly on what the rules were but they they essentially in the edit changed a lot of the film and we ended up that worked out well for us because we got a trip to la to go work in the studio up there and shoot some stuff which was heaps of fun you know i think probably like i had a cool i had cooler stuff to do 
before the edit. Like my character had some cool stuff, but hey, whatever. Like, um, but when we arrived in LA, we walked on set and you know, you're nervous, you're nervous, you're flowing all this way and you're like, how's this going to go? And he just turned around and he's like, Dave, Kelson, what's up? And like, he came and gave us a hug and we're like, this is awesome, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a good time. He was so lit. I know, I know he's got that um, persona, you know, and people are terrified, but he's a genius, dude. Like, watching him work, I just sat in awe, man. Like, and he just tell these awesome stories um, of movies that I grew up on, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I could sit and, and and it, watching his mind work and he knew everyone's job so well like so i think that uh, allows him to be such a um a force you know on how he wants things because he, he knows how the lights work he knows how the camera works he knows how the, he wants to make up you know like he's just over all, um, all over it he's he can do everyone's job like, better than them pretty much well i don't know about better but i know that he knows <laughs> it you know he's like he's just he's ridiculously smart guy and um, it was just awesome to watch him work and, and be part of something that meant so much to him. You know, we had a cool moment um, because, you know, that technology was uh, um, was being developed uh, at the time. That it was groundbreaking. Made. So, yeah, and we had no idea really, you know, what we were doing. Like most of my stuff, you know, I'm, I'm a pilot. Oh, no, sorry, I was a, the gunner in that. And I had like this, my the prop, the set was amazing, but like, the thing I was holding just it was sta- um, stationary, like you couldn't move it, and all I had was like to just like look <laughs> to like shoot things, like you know, if you're pre- pretending to shoot something, you normally got a gun, and you're like, eh, you know, like. But I was just like, and I just had to like pretend to shoot like stuff in the sky, and I was just looking at the screen screen, and he's like, and he's trying to explain what I'm shooting at. I'm like, I have no idea what these things are. He's like, so you've got a, you know, a lot of the time. <laughs> shooting at an orange mark on a green screen somewhere like it's kind of weird but um so i'm sorry i'm I'm rambling now but um when we were up in the studio in la uh transformers 2 was shooting on the on the same lot and um so that was pretty cool because you know you walk outside of you know like you go to your trailer uh and you know optimus prime is just parked right outside you know oh that's awesome and we were just like, whoa, this is so awesome. You know, and the like, bumblebee rolls up and they were like doing some shoots. But then I think the moment for me and Kelson that was just pretty, like it all dawned on us, uh, it dawned on us was we went back into the studio and James Cameron's like there with Michael Bay showing him our scene and like with all the live, like with all the stuff put in it. And, and he's just like, he's so excited. Like, check this out. And Michael Bay's like, whoa. And they were into it. And, and like Kelsey and I just like looked at each other like, what is this life, man? This is weird. Because <laughs> like, you know, so, you've yeah, spent to live a childhood. Man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you've spent a bit of time in the UK as well as America. Have you filmed in any yeah. other countries or were those the, the two main ones? Um, oh, I, I shot a commercial in Australia. So what about? That could, Sydney? Uh, in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that was I'll... good. I used to live in Sydney. And um, so it was cool to just go back over to some friends and shoot a commercial. And yeah, it's a good time. Oh, cool. How long were you living in Sydney for? Um, well, kind of on and off for the, about two years. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was an interesting time. It was kind of like uh, partly just, you know, to, to get away and live in another city for a while but um my friend was living over there and we were trying to write a show together a theater show and i just decided look man if i'm here we you know i can hang out and enjoy sydney and we can write together because we were starting to get a little bit of traction on our script and so yeah we sort of did that and had a good time and made some really good friends and it was just a good time for me you know as a, as a human as well not as an actor because i think i've been so caught up in this like actor life for ages it was nice to just go over to sydney and just kind of you know check it at the beach it was awesome do you ever like because i would imagine the life of an actor is pretty hard i mean it it must be relentless in terms of scheduling and i suppose uh, as you mentioned with when you go to an audition and then it's just the waiting period for ages and then you go to audition and then so forth and so forth yeah look it's it is, uh, look, I always look at it as, for me, when I get a job, it's kind of like being on holiday. Like, cause oh, it's okay. like, oh, I've got a job. 
I'm getting paid, you know, and I'm getting to do what I love. The job for an actor is the grind in, uh, in between the gigs because you don't, you're not guaranteed to get work. So mm. it's, that's the grind is how to keep yourself sane through that, time, um, that period of no work uh, and keep yourself busy and keep yourself primed, ready to go. Like, because, you know, you can be really busy with learning auditions and going to auditions and things like that, but you're not getting paid for it, you know? So you've yeah. also got to juggle in a way of like, how do I make a living through here? And so, you know, some, like when you're actually acting, that's when it's, that's when life's actually really cool because you're actually cool, doing what you want to do. Yeah. Cause I didn't yeah. actually realize, I mean, I was looking over your biography, how much stuff you've actually done. Like I didn't realize you'd done like a lot of voiceovers. Um, you've done more theater work. I mean, I remember watching you, you know, my fair lady and stuff at Rutherford college <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, you've done a lot of stuff. Is there, is there something besides like, do you prefer voiceovers to acting or do you prefer theater work to film or is it all kind think, of a different experience and you appreciate them all equally? Yeah, it's, I'd say that, man. I think they all have their pros and cons. Um, but like to, to make a living as an actor, especially in New Zealand, you've got to have multiple sources of income. You've got to diversify. You've got to do other things. You can't, you know, you can't just expect that you're going to get a job on Shorten Street and be on there for five five years and make a whole lot of money. Like it's just, you know, only a select people, a few people get to do that. So you've got to, you know, like take guest roles or voiceovers or you know, theatre. Like theatre was something I. I loved, like, that was how I got into uh, acting was through high school, you know, with all the shows with, um, with your brother and stuff. Doing all of that, I loved theatre. And then I went to drama school, and I remember when I finished drama school, I was like, wow, that's kind of like, I guess that's goodbye to theatre because I don't see myself really getting cast in the theatre shows as a professional actor. I'll probably get more TV work. And then the first show that I, uh, first thing I got cast in was a theatre show, and I worked, like, consistently in theatre uh, which was really cool I, and I it gave me a chance to really hone my craft uh, and and be challenged like uh, at the time silo theatre was you know just emerging as like the hot new you know venue in town and you know I'm really thankful Shane Bosher who was running it at the time saw me in a, um, an audition for another play that I was auditioning for and he cast me in uh, in the show and it was a sellout and I got ended up going back to back shows and then he really helps develop me uh, as an actor by pushing me into roles that I thought I couldn't do and be like Nate we're casting you in this and, and I, I really got to like expand and like um, and grow and be cast alongside some of the greatest actors in New Zealand and learn from them man I was just a sponge I was just like I, if I can be around these people and just listen to them and, and hang out after after the show and get any bits of advice, I'll take it. So the theatre really helped me blossom as a as a performer and as a as a human as well. Like meeting people from all walks of life was, you know, it was really formative those years um, in theatre. So I thought there's a special part uh, place in my heart for theatre, but I don't really do it anymore. <laughs> I did a <laughs> yeah. big show that um, I did a big show that toured. Uh, we went up to the Edinburgh Festival and then went to London and set up base in London and had an amazing time. But really since then, I've only done one theatre show, which was just a two-hander in Melbourne for the part of The Fringe, which was really actually amazing for me to do because the show that I'd done in London almost broke, pretty much broke me. <laughs> it was pretty hard. Was that, um, a, was that a zombie, some type of zombie yeah. show today? Yeah, yeah. I heard about yeah. it. Uh, my brother told me about it and I was trying to, I was trying to remember exactly what it was, but he tried to explain it to me and I didn't know exactly what it was. So it was kind of a theater show, but it incorporated the crowd. Is that how it worked? Yeah. I, I mean, what we labeled it was, um, it was an immersive theatrical event. So right. it, it, it was born out of, um, oh, how was it born? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it was, um, I mean, I play a lot of video games, like I love video games, and I think that uh, they have an, an incredible way of capturing people's imagination and putting them into the scene, and, and you get to like go through that narrative journey with the characters, not, and you're not 
just just running around shooting people you're getting to and, and immersed into the story and i i really care about the youth and the youth getting along to the theater but i i looked around and was like there's not really a lot of shows that at the time that like appealed to kids that like us growing up you know like mm. someone someone that can play a video game why are they going to go sit and watch a theater show that, that they don't really care about and so we sort of were like let's make something for the people that don't go to theater because everyone i felt like at the time there was a lot of theater that was being made uh that was just for other theater makers or people that love theater and so it's just like you just we're just feeding like the, this little inner circle whereas this uh, allowed us to make something that was for the general public and just have a bit of fun like stop being so pretentious and let's like let's pretend that zombies are coming to kill us um and what how would humanity act you know <laughs> and so it just evolved um and so we made a show where we our main prior, um priority was to always make the audience the lead character uh and we tried our best to make that you know to stick to that and and make it uh, realize it i guess and yeah so <laughs> it went through many iterations and we it, it grew and it grew and it grew and we ended up in london with a with a cast of jeepers uh, i think we had like 16 people in the cast and we had a rotating crew of about 25 zombies and wow. we had chain we had chainsaws we had blank firing weapons we had explosives we had blood rigs we had you know we worked with this amazing guy um our prosthetics guy in the uk called christian mallet who'd just done eddie redmayne's makeup for and won an oscar and stuff and he made this incredible zombie body um and we also like there's people like shay and Haley that um worked with us early on that made amazing prosthetics for our zombies um here so we got to really um explode um that idea of how do we make it how do we make theater for people that don't normally go to theater and mm. make a video game on stage so you basically made last of us and put it on stage or is, it, it is on that stage. one of your favorite video games is it last of us yeah i did i actually just finished playing part two the other day i took a little bit i didn't want to race it i just wanted to take my time with the story and yeah just finished that like funnily enough though when we came up with the idea for zombie i hadn't even played um last of us and it was i was actually i my costume in the first uh show my friends came up afterwards and were like i love how you paid homage to joel man you like dressed your character just <laughs> like him and i was like i don't know what you're talking about man and he was like joel like from last of us you're wearing exactly the same costume as him and i was like just a complete coincidence you know but then i after that i i uh got a ps3 and played played through that and got a lot of um a lot of ideas from from that world for the next version of of our show <laughs> yeah so that was a that was a good one that, so that so theater was really um a big part of my heart and i put a lot of work into that there but now i'm just sort of more just do voiceovers um you know audition for shows when i can hopefully you get them you know commercials yeah. pay the bills you know you get a commercial and it pays the bills um, um does the best pay yeah, come from yeah. commercials uh, I guess Usually. so. I get, I get, yeah, I guess for the amount of work you actually do, like, mm. and that's not saying that that um, commercials are easy. Sometimes doing a commercial, you're more challenged than you are when you're doing a drama series because you've got, you know, you've got to like nail it and get exactly what the client wants in that one moment. You've got like an, a day to shoot it, you know, like yeah. if they can be really technical, you know, it's like it's not necessarily that they're easy sometimes they are sometimes it's like wear this costume walk in there and do this you know but like i've had some challenging days on set when i'm shooting a commercial that i'm like jesus this is really hard but, um would the but, pineapple lumps add like uh, yeah yeah so was that a day day of shooting from memory i think it was but maybe it was two days like it's going back a, a while now the funny thing is is with that ad is i almost didn't go to the audition and um how come because i was working while well, i was working the night before at at the silo theater and i'd like i was working on the bar and had worked like a really really late shift and my audition was first thing in the morning and i woke up and was just like oh man i'm too tired i can't be bothered going to this audition and then i was like 
nah, 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 nah. Like, I can't, I can't skip out on the audition. I've got to go. And I showed up really tired and was just like, oh, I'll do it anyway, you know? And I mean, the role is like a Kiwi that sleeps in. So it was kind of perfect. Probably I probably rolled in like <laughs> a bit, of, a bit of method acting going on there. Yeah. So that was just one of those ones where, you know, you do an audition and you get that part and it was really fun to shoot. And then it got lots of popularity and then it just rolled and rolled and rolled and it would just keep coming back and suddenly, yeah, I, I think that's the that's the funny one. That's the job that everyone sort of remembers you by. Yeah, by yeah. Because yeah. it must be repetitive. You must do the same scene over and over and over. I'd imagine. Yeah, I'm, yeah, you do. You've got to, and they've got to get it right. You know, like they've got to please all the clients, and you know they're paying a lot of money to get their product out there. So, you know, it's about um, really nailing the brief, I guess, mm. and, and what they're after. But then sometimes you can do it like and. It moves really quickly. They're like, "Yeah, we're happy." And then we're moving on. Yeah, you know when you do voiceovers because you did some for Burger King, you did some for KFC. Besides from getting paid, do yeah. they give you like any perks, like free food or something? <laughs> um, <laughs> not really. Um, I think when I was doing K- the voice of KFC, um, <laughs> I was like, like I don't eat. Um, I'm pescatarian now, so I don't eat chicken anymore. But when I was in there, I was like, this was years ago, and I was doing the voiceover. And, um, you know, you're watching the the graphic of it going over and over. And I was like, talking about the, the deal. And then I was like, God, in the car, I was like, no, I'm going straight to KFC, man. I'm so hungry. Like, and I went and got KFC. And I, uh, the next time I was in the voiceover, I told them, I was like, man, the, work, the advertising worked on me. I like left here last time, went straight to go get KFC. And then I went in and, um, like a week or so later and the girl um, that was in charge of the of the, um, the job at that time she was like oh you know how you like KFC well I've got a surprise for you I've got a, I've got a bit of a voucher and I was like oh yeah it's on I'm going to be able to like have the boys over and we're going to have like buckets of KFC and she's like here's your voucher and I was like oh thanks so much thanks so much and then like I opened it up and it was like for like a snack meal <laughs> I was like for real <laughs> I was like, well, how much is that? Like four dollars or something, isn't it? Yeah. I was yeah. Like, oh man. I was like, oh damn. Um, I actually, I just recently did some voiceovers for um, Sky Sport Now, which is the new streaming service where you can stream straight to your phone or yeah, um, your device. And yeah, they they hooked me up with some uh, free subscription for that, so that was pretty cool. So, oh, that's rock pretty on, sweet. rock on Sky Sports Now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So with because with voiceovers. So that, you have to get the enunciation like perfect, right? So you have to over enunciate everything. Is that what you do? Um, I think it's just about getting it um, clarity, you know. So a lot of the time they've got a, a a lot of information they've got to cram into whatever length the ad is. So it's about getting that those words out efficiently and clear, um, and and yeah, and hitting the brief that they're after. Like sometimes people every voiceover is different. Like they may really want a hard sell. And so that means that you're like, you're going full guns um, to try and get it across as much as possible. You know, like, and you hear those ones and I don't really do those um, kind of voiceovers, but you know, where it's just like, bam, it's a word, um, word machine gun. Um, but I think it's just about being clear and, and making sure that it's the intonation is right. And that you're going up on the right word and not downward inflections and things like that. So, uh, if you get a good engineer, they will stick with you and they'll help you through it. Like sometimes you can feel a little bit lost in the booth because you're getting, you know, eight different people sitting there telling you how to say a, a word and you're like, I don't know how to say it anymore. Um, yeah, so voiceovers can be, your you can be your own worst enemy in the booth. Like, mm. it's like, you know, when you record your phone message and you're like, oh, and you listen back and you're like, that's not terrible. I'm going to go again. Yeah. You know, like it can be oh, like that. Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. no, I can't. I can't go too long without um asking you about Siona's wedding, considering I got a lot of Polynesians that watch um watch Kiwi Talks. So, uh, how did how did that come about, Siona's wedding, and how did you approach trying to be? I want to be. I want to be gangster, I suppose, or want to be Polynesian. Yeah, want to be Samoan. Oh dear it! Oh dear it! Well, I mean, like, I guess I didn't have to look too far because I'm um there's a lot of Derek in me, I guess. Um. But uh, yeah, how did that come about? That actually came about um, in a in a in a crazy way. I um so 
I was a big fan of the Naked Samoans. Like I'd seen them, uh, their work, their stage shows and their comedy stuff and was a huge fan of theirs. Um, and they were, they were doing the movie and they had actually cast the role of Derek um, uh, through one of the shows that they'd already done. They were like, oh, we're getting this guy in because he's worked with us in the past and he's going to play that role. And then um, that, uh, it turns out he, he got another role that, um, in a show that was, you know, um, was a bit of a business decision for him to go and do that because it was going to be, you know, three years right, as opposed to three weeks of shooting a feature film because feature films are shot so quick. And so he took that job and they were like, they needed to cast uh, Derek. And luckily enough, I'd done a, I'd, I've been working out in South Auckland uh, with Best Training. And um, there was some drama students out there that had written scripts and I helped develop the scripts and then we performed them. And we did a one-off performance at the Herald Theatre in, in the city to sort of showcase their work and celebrate these young Pacific uh, writers and uh, from Best Training. And I played a rapper in that and uh, was like, the white boy rapper in this one, in one of these um, scripts. And uh, Oscar had was in the audience that night and he, he saw it. I didn't speak to him afterwards um, and or anything like that, but I did the show and it was a one-off and just sort of, you know, that was that. And then, I don't know how many, like a year or so later, my agent called me up and was like, look, they're making this movie, Sioni's Wedding. They um, they have to recast this role. Um, they're turning it around really quickly because they're ready to shoot. Um, uh, but they've heard of you because um, I think someone's seen you in a show. And it turned out Oscar had seen me um, in the show and remembered me because of my my last name is Van Horn, which is like you know it's not a very common name in um, yeah. in New Zealand. But there was a there was an NBA player um, called Keith Van Horn, and he was like this guy Keith Van Horn, this guy Keith Van Horn. And the people were like, there's no one called Keith Van Horn in New Zealand, like, um, but they were like, there's David Van Horn, and he was like, yeah, yeah, that guy. So I went in for an audition, and I'm well. I, at that point, you didn't get your auditions emailed to you. Now they're just emailed to you, but you had to go to your agency and like pick up the script, and they'd left it for me in the letterbox, you know, and it would be all folded up, and you'd like get the script down the letterbox. And um, my best mate Fluffy Tua um, Amosa, who's an awesome actor. Um, he, I, I hit him up and was just like, yo man, this is my role, but I need your help. Like, I need to like, make sure I'm like saying um, um, my pronunciation is correct on all of these uh, Samoan words and, you know, like, will you help me out? And we, we sat at my place that night and went over the script and he helped me out massively. And I went in the next day, auditioned, and I just, like, when you walk into an audition room and you do well, you can really feel that energy shift, like, and you're like, yeah, man, I'm, 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 I'm doing well here, you know, like, I, I've got this, I feel like I've got this under control, um, but that also can be really, um, that same thought process can actually screw you up, because there's so many times where I've been like, yeah, man, I'm nailing this, and then you just never hear anything, <laughs> you know, like, um, but there was something special about that, like, I just had it in my mind, I was like, this is my role, I'm going to get this role. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be cast. And I think the next, like, they called me up the next day and I had it and I had to go straight through to get a medical. Because you have to get a medical when you're doing a film like that to just make sure that, like, for insurance purposes, you're all clear. You're not going to, like, oh, true. Uh, get sick throughout. And um, so I did that and then went straight to a read through and, and met all the guys. And I was, all, I was, like, in awe of them all, man. I was starstruck. I was like, oh, this is. I, I've, you know, like, I really want to do a good job here. And, like, immediately, like, we walk in the room and I did the most Derek thing possible way, eh? like, with my shim, like, just being so nervous. But I walked up and Oscar's like, sup, man, how's it going? And he went like, like, he went like this. And I thought he was going for, like, a, a handshake. And he just turned into a fist bump. And I was like, what is this? And I was like... <laughs> Oh man, it's like everyone just laughs and I was just like, oh damn. And they're like, perfect casting, perfect casting. <laughs> so um, yeah, but those guys, oh man, big um, big place in my heart for the for that crew because that was just, yeah, it was a dream come true to work with them. And they're, you know, it's such a family, um, such a family to be part of. I'm really, I'm blessed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, with, with cool. um, 
with memorizing scripts, how difficult is it to do that? Because I've got a terrible memory and I, so I'm trying to imagine trying to memorize like a massive script. What's your process mm. in terms of memorizing it? Um, I, yeah, it's funny because I sometimes think about that as well. And I'm like, I don't know how, I'd, how I've done that in the past. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I could do it again. Um, but I guess it's just like anything that it's like a muscle that you work out. So, um, you know, just like going to the gym and working out, like if your mind is, you know, if you're constantly reading scripts and retaining that, you, you just sort of, that strengthens. Like you meet an actor that's worked on Shorten Street for a couple of years and they can pick up a script and they remember it because they're just like constantly having to like learn a script. Uh, I think for me, what always worked was just reading it without, without the pressure of trying to learn it. Just like, I'm just going to read this. I'm just going to read it and I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to just allow the words to sink in. And if you're trying to remember it, that's bad. But if you're allowing it to come out and you're, and you're actually listening, um, it actually, that's the key. If you can listen and you can listen to the other lines, then you just respond with, you're like, oh, that's how I respond. Mm. So it's just, a, a yeah, it's getting into a good frame of mind that allows the, that, that script to sink in and if it's a well-written script you'll remember it really quickly if it's it's generally the ones that are, are not not the best writing that are harder to learn because the character may have like a massive jump um, in between one line and you're like i just can't remember what that next line is like mm. you know because it's such a shift you know because you're not going through it uh, i think for me i um as soon as i got out of like i'm not very good at just sitting down and working like i need to be up moving so I, um, I'm better if I walk around the house or learn the lines while, but it used to be while I was shooting hoops. So I'd just go down to the park and shoot hoops and learn my lines there and have the script on the ground. And what oh, was that line again? And then like shoot hoops because I'm just getting it into my body rather than just trying to like jam it into my head. And so, you know, doing the dishes or cooking or driving is a really good time to learn lines. Do you say them out loud? Do you say them out loud uh, yeah. or are you just reading them and... And printing them in your brain I think, or is it a bit of both I think you, it's a bit of both like um I, I i try to not speak the lines until i'm like know what i'm saying because you know um it can be you can get caught in a trap and think oh that's how that line's meant to be said but if you do your research and you you analyze the script then you're like um it makes more sense and it's better to speak it then when you actually know what you're saying but sometimes it's like, it depends on how much time you've got for an audition. You might grab it and just like, blah, 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 and you're just reading it aloud the whole way. So you like to see what it is. But I've, got, I've gotten better at reading scripts and learning lines because I, I've worked as a casting assistant for many, many years. So um, I would read opposite people while they're coming for their audition. So um, I would play that same part over and over for everyone that's coming in, you know, that day. And so you... Um, you can't mess up the lines then because you don't want to screw up someone else's audition. Like that's the worst thing that can happen as a reader if you like ruin their their audition. So I've like gotten good at that because and and reading is reading for auditions is where I've learned so much about acting. Um, but you want to give as much eye contact as possible because it's about connecting, right? Like like really like I think we get too caught up on the words and like how to get the words right the main thing that you care about when you're watching something is the connection between the two actors if there's no connection and there's no um care for the characters then what's the point of watching it um so I as a reader try to learn the script as much as I can so I can be there and be present for the person who's auditioning and I can be giving them as much of my energy to help them out and support them because it's terrifying sometimes you know you get you're in that room and you really want that role and like you're like if I get this role I can pay my rent you know it's like, there's a lot riding on it for people so you don't want to screw it up you know you want to like really give them the best chance possible and I love working with actors you know and so that's been a, a time for me to really hone my craft while watching other people work and learning lines on the, on the fly can you yeah. cry on cue like can someone just be like action and then you just cry because I would imagine that would be the hard, one of the hardest things to do as an actor is the real, real dramatic, dramatized stuff where you have to like be in tears or something. Yeah, look, I, I don't have the skill set to be able to just cry immediately like that. Some people can turn that on. It's like a tap. But if you get yourself in the right headspace um, and you're good to go and the crew, like I had to cry. Oh, I didn't have to cry, but I was, I was doing an emotional scene recently 
and um, I had to remove myself from distractions of set because you know there's a lot of um, messing about in between like as they're moving the camera and there's you know your actors put over in the tent you can be sitting chatting to your fellow actors and there's snacks and there's you know there's all this you know you can distract yourself as much as you want on set but if you need to get yourself in in the right headspace that's up to you as a professional to remove yourself from any distractions to get yourself into that state you know otherwise it's not going to be like no one wants to sit there and watch someone on tv trying to cry you know that's just it's just not fun to watch and it's yeah, not believable yeah. you know but if like the the best bit of advice i've ever been given if, um for crying on cue or for a scene is it's quite the opposite because like if you're telling yourself cry 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 you're not gonna your head's you know you're not gonna do that your muscle memory is generally when you're when you actually cry for real what's circulating in your head is like don't cry i'm not gonna cry i'm not gonna cry and that and you cry so you actually have to fool yourself so that actually works better than um than telling myself i'm gonna cry in the scene i'm gonna cry it's like i'm not gonna cry i'm not gonna cry i'm not gonna cry and it actually muscle memory puts you into that zone oh true that's interesting yeah yeah, because I mean, like, not everyone's like, oh, I feel some tears coming on. I'm going to cry in front of all these people. Like, you tell yourself, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've obviously spent time in the UK and Sydney. How come How come you chose to come back to Auckland or New Zealand, for that matter? How come you yeah, didn't well, choose to stay? Probably because, you know, I'd imagine the opportunities would be, there'd be more of them overseas than here. Well, yeah, uh, so look, there are more opportunities, but there's more people as well. There's more, like, there's there's a longer queue of people auditioning for things. Um, yeah, that's true. It just, honestly, man, it just didn't work out that way for me. Like, I went to Sydney and was like, I'm going to start, you know, trying to get work as an actor over here. And um, as well as, you know, I was writing the script with um, my dear friend, um, Simon London and we were working on that and I was like getting I was actually getting voice work in Australia which was really cool because I had a job I was the voice of Kathmandu in New Zealand and Australia so I was able to just record either in New Zealand or in Sydney wherever I was and do all the voiceovers for that so I sort of landed in Sydney with a job that, um, that was good and that kind of got me a little bit more uh, traction as a voiceover artist over there um, and I I had struggled to get an, uh, an agent at first when I went there because there was a there was at that time there was a lot of Kiwi actors that were moving to Australia and they'd be like they'd get an agent and they'd be like yeah man I've moved here and then they'd come back to New Zealand and the agent would call them up and be like yo I've got an audition and they're like oh, I'm back in New Zealand so they, there was a resistance to signing any Kiwis due to the fact that they probably will piss off back home so. I finally signed up with an agency over there that I really respected and, and they were cool. And my first audition, I went along for this like for this feature film and had one of the best auditions I'd had of my in my life. You know, it was one of those ones where you're like, yeah, man, this is awesome. And um, I got my agent called me up, and I the main thing is I, I really wanted to prove that I was worthy of being on their books because. I kind of had felt like they'd taken me on as a little bit of a favor to my agent because my New Zealand agent had connections with them and was like, look, this guy is like, he's worked heaps in New Zealand and he's a good friend of ours. And I, I, I didn't feel confident enough in my resume or my work. Um, so I wanted to prove to them that I, that I could do it. And so I worked my butt off on that audition and went there and, and had a great audition. And then they, called me up and they were like, look, man, the director wants to meet you. You're going to get, you know, like you're, you're right in line for this part. And I was just like, oh my God, I've had a home run on my first audition in Australia. This is amazing. Um, but I was actually coming back to New Zealand and I was like, oh no, I'm, going, I'm on my way back to New Zealand to do a job. And they were like, that's fine. It, it doesn't matter. He'll just meet you over Skype. I think it was at the time. They're like, he'll just give you a call and you can have a chat. Uh, and I was sort of waited and I didn't hear from them. And then the, the movie fell over and I was like, oh, damn it. You know, um, it. Uh, so that movie never happened, you know, and it's just kind of one of those things you like, where you sometimes ponder what if, but um, what happened with coming back from Sydney was our, um, we were writing the zombie show at the time, Simon and I, and we got, we got funding to shoot and uh, to put it on in Auckland. So we, um, I moved back to Auckland and 
we did that um, that show, and then we did one down in Christchurch, um, and then we started prepping to go up to Edinburgh. So I just moved away from Sydney because I was creating my own show, like with my best friends, and that was my priority. So I bailed from there and just I haven't got I'm I haven't considered moving back to Sydney just because life hasn't played out that way really, you know, like yeah. And then I was in I, I found myself in London doing the show and we were there for, you know, the better part of the year and I had a five year visa because I had an ancestry visa, um, which I was fortunate enough to to get, which allowed me to work there. Uh and I finished the show because we were doing a crazy season, man. Like it's hard to describe, but our show was like an hour and 15 minutes long. And it was like a, like by the end of it, I'd felt like I'd played a game of rugby. Like I was shattered, man. I was dripping with sweat. I'd quite often be throwing up partway through the show. Cause I was playing like this, this soldier that was like running around doing fight scenes and fighting off zombies and moving the audience through this, you know, our maze of a set that it was. Um, and I was shattered, but we were doing 18 shows a week. So I'd do like on a Saturday, I'd do four mm-hmm. shows in a row. And so I was just, I was completely dead. I was a shell of a person by the end of that season. And I went to Spain and I actually had a month in Spain where I, I walked um, the Camino. And that was a chance for me to just really reflect. I don't know if you know about the Camino, but it's a pilgrimage that happens where you walk across, you start in the South of France and you walk across Spain. Um, and I took that time out for myself to just sort of heal and figure out what I wanted to do next. And I, at that point, I, when I started, I was like, I'm, I'm going back to London and I'm going to um, set up shop as an actor and try and start again. Cause our show had completely closed down in London. And I was like, uh, and it closed prematurely as well. We thought we were going to the end of the year, but we had to shut the show off early. And so it was a real blow to your ego. And, um, and I was like, well, do I go back to London? And then I, I'm not sure, but I was, when I was in Spain, I was just daydreaming about being back in New Zealand. You know, it was like, I missed my family and I missed my friends. And not that I didn't have awesome friends in London, but I, I, I kind of was like, man, it's going to be summer in New Zealand. Maybe I'll just go home for the summer. And <laughs> came back and I didn't go, <laughs> didn't go didn't back. Go back. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also, it's like when you, when you travel to um, a place like London, if you go there with the mindset of like, I'm going there to break through as an actor, I'm going to get a flat, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get an agent and I'm going to go through that process. Then you're like mentally prepared for that. But I'd gone to London off the back of a sellout show at the Edinburgh Festival and we'd moved to London. We were putting this on. I was like a lead role in the show that I had created and I was working with all my, like with a lot of my best mates and Suddenly that's all gone. And I'm like, now I'm on my own in London. I have to like find a new place to live. I have to find, you know, it was just, it just seemed way too hard. And I was just like, I need to, I need to get out of here and recoup and, and decide what I actually want to do. Well, London's very fast paced compared to here. I mean, I remember going through the uh, London underground train station. It was like watching something on fast forward, you know, just with the way people yeah, people are just running towards yeah, the- trains. It's just um, yeah, the volume of the volume of people that are moving through that city at any one time is just it's, um, it's crazy, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and um, that's exhausting, you know. Like, and also like when when it's winter there and you don't have a lot of money and you're in a tiny little place, you know, and, you, and like as soon as you step out your door in London, you're spending money. Oh, yeah. it's like oh, I don't even have a job, man. I got to get home. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, unfortunately, like I haven't got a lot of like skills that I mean like I could go get a job and make coffee over there because there's lots of you know but I was, I was like oh man I don't even know how to make coffee I can't even get a job at a cafe man I'm terrible I gotta go home <laughs> are you good at um doing accents like how good are you at doing uh, different accents I, um, um I think American accents um the American accent like the neutral American um accent fits pretty comfortably in my in my body like I I I feel more comfortable sometimes in an American accent than I do in my own Kiwi accent. Um, so that I'd say is my strength, but I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, like a mimic. Like there's some people that are just incredible. They can mimic anyone and they can do any accent. I, I, I have to work on them, but I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. It just, it just depends really. Yeah. I, I take mean- my time with it. 
and there's there's also some websites reference websites you know oh is there oh yeah well that helps yeah. i suppose yeah 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 there's a really cool one actually um for anyone who's like wants to look up accents it's called idea the international dialect education oh, i can't remember what it is now but um uh you, you go on that website and you can basically pick which country and then and, and under each country there'll be like a reading from a male in uh who's 25 in this year and then there's a female you know and from this district and you can actually find the district and try and find someone closer to your age or the character's age and and get and they're reading it's just a person from that neighborhood reading a, a piece of text so you can wow. actually hear their cadence yeah so it's really it's quite fascinating that's good. Yeah. So um, uh, I, do- I use that as. What's that? Yeah. Um. Okay, so you, you you can do an Australian accent. You must be able to do an Australian accent. Yeah, the Australian accent isn't actually. I don't actually um. Good have mate. to alter it too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you can do the you can do the caricature Australian accent, um. But like whenever I've had to do a, a voiceover that's Australian, it's like. It's not much different. You just like there's a certain words that ping like you know text, you know like yeah, you know, yeah. The, yeah, or anything like that. But I think to try to get it to sit as neutral and real in your in your voice, um, you don't want to do like a comic book version of it yeah. or a cartoon version of the yeah. Of the next, I suppose you know. over enunciating. Yeah, yeah. But well, it's just like you know, not not every Kiwi walks around going beach stairs, bro. You know, yeah. like with this. <laughs> You know, it's just it's not not accurate. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. And the the Australian accents. I mean, there's some people that obviously they have a lot more thicker. They have a thicker mm. accent than than others. Yeah, depending on what part of the the country you're from. Just like here, how the the Kiwi accent is a lot thicker in the south, in the South Island. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. But it's, it's funny when you've been overseas and you come back. Um, I remember I've been away for the, you know the year in London. You come back to the airport and someone asks for your passport and you're like, "Oh my God, we do sound like that." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I remember hearing myself first time I did this. I'm like, "Ugh, is that how I sound?" Mm-hmm. Particularly like I think I listened to Lord on uh, Stephen Colbert or something, and I was like, "Far out." Is that how Kiwis sound? I think when you keep hearing yeah. your own accent all the time, you don't realize how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, is there is there a dream director you'd like to work with, or was James Cameron it? I mean, James Cameron definitely was, um, you know, right up there for me. Like he he was someone that I I really admired. Um, so that uh, has that took that box, I guess. But man, look, there's so many. Eh, like Scorsese. I think well, we've got my um, yeah, Scorsese. Um, uh, is is rad. Um. Do you like Chris Nolan? Man. Yeah, I mean, I like his stuff. Yeah, I, I, mm. but uh, to be honest, man, I think I'm really in, um, excited and inspired by by the new wave of directors that are coming through. Um, you know, with the the huge push for diversity, um, with people of color and and women. You know, <laughs> like getting a get in their shot. Like it's been you know, old white men for so long. Yeah, well, that is the predominant role, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I look, I guess it's not so much, I, I I mean, I love so many different films and it would be more like something like going, I'd want to be in that franchise. You know, that would make my life, my dreams come true. But like yeah. not so much a director, I guess, unless the projects. So um, when you say franchise, are we talking like Marvel type franchise? Yeah, dude, if I was in Star Wars, I'd just be like, yo, I'm done now. Cool, man. Like, let's just chill. Have you ever, <laughs> <I> can... <laughs> have you ever run into Taika Waititi by any chance? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have I have run into him. I wouldn't say he's like my best mate, but I've met him around the um around the place and he um he was he did a few shows at the Silo Theatre when I was working back there in the day and um so I've I've you know, hung out with Taika a couple of times back then, but no, I'm not. I'm not close with him, but he's a cool did, dude. He's a real yeah. cool dude. Did you ever foresee that he'd become as big as he has? Well, I just don't think anyone could like, like, dude. That guy like hit a grand slam. Like, it's just insane. Like, yeah, yeah. Who could who could have picked that? You know, like, um. But what was un, um, undeniable was the fact that Taika had an incredible work ethic and had 
such an energy that is infectious. You know, people just want to be around him and he's hilarious and he's captivating and he's super talented, but he works hard, man. And that's what it comes down to. Like, mm. he's got a great ability um, to, like, appear like it all just comes off the cuff, but the dude works, you know, he works real hard uh, at, at everything he does. And so full credit for him, man. Like, it's, it's, a, it's quite remarkable where he's at now it's amazing yeah it's cool it's always cool to see like new zealand uh directors on the international stage yeah and i mean he just is he's just really put new zealand on the map in a, in a positive way and he's um he's a great ambassador for new zealand uh and i'm full credit man he's awesome but, and he's a funny dude as well he had me like in tears like hanging out with him like one night when we we hung out it was pretty cool yeah have you um it's the same as like the same with like the flavor concords at the time you know like you know they got laughed out of the building when they tried to pitch their show in new zealand to a tv company like with tv production house and then they go on hbo like picks them up and they're like international celebrities it's yeah like it's awesome and then everyone it's loves great. them and they're just normal well. dudes they're just normal people you know like and that's what's so really what's so um amazing to watch is that like, they're not trying to be something else they're just very much themselves and that's what i think is so appealing i think that often happens with the general public though they put actors on a bit of a pedestal and put them almost like a deity or a god sometimes and then you meet them and they're just normal yeah i mean i think also like the, there's um there's a lot there there are those um actors that are a bit whack that are a bit like you know, have quirks about them oh, and yeah, yeah, the media pick up, they pick up on that and they, and that's what we know. And it goes down. It's like, did you know that this person does this? And did it? and then it's like every act is labeled like that. But a lot of the time people just want to be normal people, but their, their craft is that they entertain. Mm. You know? yeah. And I think it, I think it does definitely affect people um, having, being treated like, god status wherever you go like it it messes with you like it definitely would it, it, it definitely would change who you are if like i mean like look at the state of someone like kanye you know like uh who has clearly has um mental health issues but has a team around him that aren't stopping him from doing things you know yeah, like, yeah totally you know like that people are telling him going yeah man you're great you can do this it's just like when really you need your best mate to step in and be like, hold up, bro, you need to rethink this or yeah. you're not in the right frame of mind, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think it can affect people. It can definitely affect uh, child stars. Like, you know, if you've been raised in the Hollywood spotlight uh, and, you know, and you've never been told no, then of course you're going to turn out to be, a, you know, someone yeah, that, yeah. Oh, I don't want to call anyone names, <laughs> but, you know, you're going to like, yeah. Yeah cool man well um i might wrap um, up there was there anything yeah, else to mention or talk about though no, no. no dude it was like it was just awesome to sit down and chat and um i guess the main thing for me is like i was when i was thinking about this i was like why do you want to even talk to me like kind of just you know there's far more interesting people uh it's so cool to you know connect um you know after all these years and I think the thing that I guess I could offer is that if anyone is out there, you know, pursuing any kind of creative venture, it's just like keep in the keep up the hard work and um, and you know tell your stories and do what um, do what inspires you. You know, like don't try and be anyone else. And uh, it's just it's that work ethic, man. Stick at it. Like my whole thing, my motto early on was. You know, like no one's ever going to tell me to that I can't be an actor. Like I'll decide that. You know, like I'll yeah, decide yeah. when I don't want to do this anymore. And I think you've got to have that sheer determination to get through those hard times. And whatever it is that you're doing, find find your creative outlet. You know, even if you're not in a creative industry to make a living, find your creative freedom. Like it's 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 liberating and it like it fulfills you as a person. And um, that would be my my little my my bit of advice to anyone out there is just like to find That's what good advice is, find what yeah find what you do that like gives you joy and um and creating stuff and uh is, is a 
is a remarkable thing. And I think we've got, as humans, we get to do that. So why not embrace your time on this planet? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you might affect some other people as well. People might look at your stuff and be like, that's cool, man. Like, and that inspired me to do what I want to do. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you have anything in the pipeline that you can mention that you're working on or is it all confidential and you're like, nah? <laughs> yeah, I guess that, that's, that's the um, hard thing. I've signed a couple of contracts that, um, you know, don't allow me to talk about that, which sounds, sounds kind is of it hard and, um, to keep stuff a secret. Like, cause you'd have to keep it secret guess, for like a year or two years or something, wouldn't you? Yeah. I guess it's kind of, it's interesting because, Within the circles of my of my colleagues and and my my friends, we all kind of know what's happening. So like you kind of like people know. So it's not like you have to keep it like secret. Like no one's allowed to know this. People, you know, and you can tell your family, but it's just like you can't broadcast to the world what you're up to. Um, but like I had a um, I've had a guest role in a really cool show that like I would be excited to watch. You know, that's um, that'll be coming out at some point in the well when. Jeepers. in the next couple of years i'll say like <laughs> uh, and then um i've actually taken uh, i took a role where i was working as a um as an acting coach on a on a job where i was working with a young actor so i'm looking to pick that back up again soon and and that's an exciting cool project where i'm on set cool. and i get to work with young actors because i mean that's the thing is you've got to give back and um, i'm not saying i'm trying to teach this kid how to act or the, you know or kids how to act but you can help them um discover their uh, professional side of being an actor of how it is to like there's lots that goes into it other than just learning your lines and and, and showing up um, on the day it's about how to conduct yourself in a professional manner so oh, I have that knowledge to pass on to the youth then that's cool yeah. cool do you have any um, social media pages or anything where anyone can follow you or are you just you're a shh, shh, um, yeah I mean time. if you want to follow if you want to follow my Instagram go for it man <laughs> but like it's basically just me acting like a clown or like photos of you know, my yeah my friends and family but yeah i guess i'm on instagram and my um handle on that is the van hornet so yeah, <laughs> yeah. cool man yeah. well hey this has been great uh yeah, yeah so cool. if anyone wants to follow you it's just what well, i suppose david van horn i suppose on instagram yeah if, if you look up um david van horn but yeah the handles the van hornet van hornet my, my yeah my alter ego <laughs> <laughs> cool all right <laughs> Uh, well, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And, uh, yeah, stay safe until next time. <laughs>